Well, uh, we've been talking about, throughout this series, the, um, what we call the solas of the Reformation. So we dealt with uh, sola gratia, grace alone, in the last talk. Before that, we looked at sola scriptura, or scripture alone. Uh, and then before that, we talked about sola fide, or faith alone. And these principles of the Reformation, you know, as they're often called, really define the churches of the Reformation in response to specific controversies that they are engaging in in the medieval period. And now we get to this uh, Christ alone, sola. And as I talked about these solas before, I talked about how three of them are usually used by Lutheran churches and five of them are used by the Reformed generally. So the last two that I'm talking about are ones that tend to be used more in Calvinistic churches, and that is Solus Christus and then Soli Deo Gloria, which will be um, the last of these. So uh, let's talk a little bit then about what this means. Solus Christus, what are we talking about with Christ alone? Christ alone, what? Uh, You know, what, what, what question is this answering or responding to? Uh, Well, I want to take a step back and talk a little bit about just the Lutheran Reformation as a whole and talk a little bit about the role of Christ in the Lutheran Reformation. I will say that the the Solus Christus is a little bit different than some of the others that we've talked about already in that it's not actually as clearly identified with a particular theological controversy in the same way. Right, so we have the question of uh, what is your ultimate authority in the church that determines truth? Scripture alone. How is a sinner justified? Faith alone. Uh, what is it that saves us? Grace alone. And those are all very specific responses to certain controversies. Now, Christ alone doesn't quite work in the same way because generally you're not going to find a lot of the medieval church, if they're challenged, say that we're not saved by Christ alone or there's another Savior besides Christ. They're not going to say that, really. Um, There is going to be a bit of a challenge to the centrality of Christ's saving work with the cult of the saints as it shows up in the medieval church. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, But even with the cult of the saints, there isn't going to be talk of anyone as a, like, co-savior with Jesus. Um, Well, at least not yet in Rome. Uh, And and I say that because there there is a proposal by some uh, that Mary would be considered co-redemptrix or a co-redeemer with Christ. Um, This is something that many believed was actually going to be made uh, by an infallible papal decree by Pope John Paul II before his death. He never did that. Um, He was a very uh, Marian-focused pope. And uh, you can find a number of Roman Catholic theological works that actually do speak about Mary as co-redeemer. I've got a dissertation on my bookshelf that is an argument for co-redemptrix as a proper title for, for Mary. So... You do find this, I guess, to, to some degree, uh, at least as a proposal in Rome. And, and if that were ever to become dogma, that would uh, certainly hamper any kind of uh, ecumenical dialogues in really significant ways. Um, so, I don't know. But at least as of right now, that's not currently the, the teaching. So, we're going to start with a positive approach instead of just talking about you know, what's wrong with the cult of the saints. We're going to get there and talk about that a bit, why that matters. But we're going to start with a positive approach. So, the Lutheran Reformation is, by its nature, Christocentric, which means it centers on Christ. The Lutheran Reformation is centered on Jesus in his person and work in ways that really no other Christian theological tradition is. The Christ-centered nature of our theology and practice really infuses everything that we talk about. It is in all of our practice, uh, our liturgy and worship. It is in our doctrines. Uh, It's in just the way that we phrase things and talk to each other within our tradition. Sometimes because of this, there has been an accusation that Martin Luther's theology is not just Christocentric, but Christomonistic. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, a monism is, is a term that you'll sometimes hear in different philosophies. 
uh, basically meaning one-ism, that all things are one. So a Christomonism basically would be the idea that you have basically gotten rid of everything else and only talk about Jesus, as in like there's no other talk about the God the Father or no talk about the Holy Spirit or anything else. That would be Christomonism. Um, now, I don't think that's the case. <laughs> uh, I don't think it is the case that we speak of only Christ and don't speak about the other persons of the Trinity. I think that's a, a, a false accusation. Uh, but I would also say, in, in some sense, when we are talking about Christ, we are talking about the other two persons. Like, we can't divorce the persons of the Trinity. Uh, and th- there's a particular reason I say that, and one is that Scripture s- repeatedly says that the Son is the image of the Father. Right? The Son images the Father. Jesus says things like, you know, y- you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Like, there is this reflection of who the Father is. Um, scripture says that Jesus is the you know, exact imprint of the Father's nature. So in focusing on Christ, we are also seeing and glorifying the Father. When you look at the work of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit, maybe kind of strangely, seemingly, doesn't really focus a lot on himself. Like the role of the Holy Spirit is usually to bring people to a knowledge of Jesus. So if we are looking to Christ and being Christ-centered, we are only Christ-centered as the Holy Spirit makes us Christ-centered. He's the one at work doing that. And he wants us to be Christ-centered. Uh, now, certainly that should not be you know, an excuse for us to ignore the Father or Spirit in our talk either. Um, but that's, uh, that's a common uh, critique that you, may, that you may find. Well, I want to look a little bit briefly at just the other solas and just quickly mention how it is that this particular idea of Christ being at the center, Christ alone, relates to the other solas that we've talked about, or sole. Um, We talked about uh, sola fide, faith alone, that we are justified by faith alone or through faith alone. Well, sola fide is really justification by Christ alone. What does it mean that we are justified through faith alone? As we talked about in that talk, justification through faith alone is not the idea that God justifies us or declares us righteous because our faith is so good. God does not look at your faith and say, boy, I'm really proud of you because your faith is so great. Good job. Um, No, God looks at you and sees the one that your faith clings to, which is Jesus. Faith saves or faith justifies because it is faith that looks to Christ and grasps Christ and his righteousness and forgiveness. And so justification through faith alone really is justification through Christ alone. In some sense, we could also say this, that, and I'll talk about this you know, in a little bit more detail, but our justification is really Christ's justification. So scripture uses the language that Jesus is justified at his resurrection, justified by the Spirit. You know, Paul's, Paul says this, writing to Timothy, so that he's justified by the Spirit, vin- or, or is translated sometimes as vindicated by the Spirit. It's the same term for justification that he uses in Romans. And Paul in Romans also says that we are justified by his resurrection. And that may be a little odd, because when we think of justification, we probably tend to think of Jesus' death, right? It's his death, atones for sins, we're forgiven for our sins because of the cross of Jesus Christ. And so our justification is through the cross. Well, Paul certainly associates justification with the cross other places, but here he says it's specifically by his resurrection that we're righteous. Well, I think the reason for that is because if we understand that Jesus, he is is justified at his resurrection, well, what does that mean? He's not a sinner, so why does he need to be justified? Well, he is declared righteous. He is declared the righteous one. Unlike us, though, he is not declared righteous as one who is unrighteous, but he is declared righteous because he is righteous. It is an actual and true declaration over the Son that he is actually and truly perfectly righteous at his resurrection. When you are justified, sola fide, by faith alone, your justification or that declaration that you are righteous is not some separate thing from Jesus' own justification. What does faith do? Faith looks to Christ and faith faith grasps Christ. So in other words, when I have faith, I am brought into the reality of the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so all that is his becomes mine. Luther likes to use this marriage imagery 
what is mine is his, what is his is mine. All that he has becomes mine. What that means is that I am brought into the reality of Jesus' own justification, and I am righteous because I share in his righteousness. And this is why, in contrast to some claims from Rome that our view of justification is a, a kind of legal fiction, if you've heard this criticism before, that you know what we really believe is that God can just kind of declares things almost falsely, right? It's like, well, you're not righteous, but God just kind of says you are. You're, that's not how this works. You're not righteous just because God says you are. You are righteous because Jesus is righteous, and you are brought into him. Like, it's a real righteousness, because Jesus really did fulfill the law. Jesus really is perfectly righteous, and he really was truly declared righteous at the resurrection, and you really are truly brought into him and his righteousness and faith. So you are righteous before God because of Christ and because you really do receive his righteousness. And faith brings us into that reality. So that's where the solus Christus and solus, uh, sola fide come together. Faith alone really is justification through Christ alone. Uh, well, then we have uh, the sola gratia that we had just talked about for those who were in the, the last talk, which is grace alone, that we are saved uh, by the work of God through grace alone. We don't collaborate or cooperate in our conversion or our justification. God is the one that does all the work. He grants us faith as a divine gift uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Salvation through grace alone really means, again, Christ alone because I am attributing my salvation not to me or my effort or my work, but to Christ who accomplished it for me. What about sola scriptura, scripture alone? How does that relate to solus Christus here? Well, when we speak about scripture alone being our authority, the, the only uh, the infallible authority that is God uh, breathed, that is inspired, we are not just identifying scripture as that which is factually true, though it is, it is factually true. What is the greatest significance of the word of God? What is its primary purpose? Jesus rebukes the Pharisees for thinking they have life in scripture when they don't because they don't know him. So scripture is as important as it is because it is the God-given means by which we know Christ. Right? It is the God-given means by which God reveals Christ to us. So, sola scriptura should lead us to solus Christus. You could believe that every word of scripture is actually true without getting the point of scripture. The Pharisees did, right? They believed everything that the scripture said was true. They believed it was divinely inspired by God. Uh, they wouldn't say any of it was false, but they missed Christ, which was the whole point. So it's not going to do you any good if you say all of Scripture is true if you don't get the point of Scripture, which is the person of Jesus who reveals himself there. All right. Well, there's uh, the connection between this and some of the other solas that we have, we have talked about. Now, I want to talk a little more about this kind of Christocentric approach to theology that has really characterized the Lutheran Church specifically. And I want to ask this question to start. That is, how is it that we know God? How do you know him? How do you know anything about God? Where do you start? What is your starting point? Well, the church has, in different eras, had some debates about the kind of best way maybe to know God or describe who God is. And one of those is the apophatic method. And apophatic was probably not a you know, common word that you use in your everyday vocabulary. But uh, the, the apophatic way of doing theology is something that shows up in a writer, especially in a writer called Pseudo-Dionysius. And uh, Pseudo-Dionysius, he has the name Dionysius from a companion of St. Paul. So he's called Pseudo-Dionysius because it's not actually Dionysius that wrote these particular treatises. He's got a series of treatises here. One is the, the Divine Names, which is very uh, well known. And he's a writer in the early church that comes to have uh, a lot of influence on peop how people understand God in the Middle Ages. And Pseudo-Dionysius is extremely influential on the development of Eastern theology. So in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, um, he's really one of the most significant figures just altogether in their history. Well, within his, his works, uh, Dionysius speaks about how it is that we come to know God best. And he says the way that we really know God is through 
uh, what's called the apophatic method, uh, or sometimes it's referred to as the, uh, the, the negative way, the via negativa, and that is the idea that we know God best by knowing what he is not. Now, obviously, there's truth to this method, because a lot of things we say about God are negations. A lot of things that we do say about God are ways to differentiate God from creatures. I can't in the f- know God in his fullness of his essence. That's totally beyond anything that I know. What I do know is my limitations, and I know whatever my limitations are, those aren't things that God has. Uh, so even when we say things like, you know, God is omnipresent, What the heck does it mean to be present everywhere? I don't really know what that means in its fullness. What I know is I'm limited to being in one place, and I know whatever limit I have, God doesn't have. Right? That's what we're saying. We say that God is all-powerful, omnipotent. What we are really saying is I know I have human weaknesses, and God doesn't have those. So many of the things that we do say about God are kind of negations. right? They're they're things that we understand that God doesn't have the same limits that, that creatures do. Now, Dionysius takes this a bit farther than just saying that, in that uh, Dionysius believes that Christian spirituality and piety ultimately should lead you into a life of prayer, and that the highest form of prayer is basically a prayer by which you negate any positive thought about God at all. And, And he basically wants you to come to a state of really not knowing anything, kind of a sitting before God with kind of in silence, kind of emptying your mind, so that Christian growth is really about this process of negation, which often happens within a kind of prayerful, mystical contemplation. And, yeah, that end goal is that wordless, thoughtless prayer, as they say. This really develops within the Hesychastic tradition. It's very influential, in, which is an Eastern monastic tradition that develops later. So that's one answer that people have given to knowing God, right? We start with the, the via negativa. We, we take a primarily apophatic approach, kind of looking at God as what he, he is not. Uh, then, of course, you have the opposite of that, which is called the cataphatic, which is making positive statements about God. Uh, and with someone like, uh, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas in the medieval period, you have the development of and not to say that this wasn't there before, but at least in a developed form within Thomas Aquinas, uh, you have the, the way of analogy, which is understanding God primarily by way of, of using analogies. So understanding that when we say, we can say all sorts of positive things about God and who he is, we don't have to just say negative things, but with an understanding that when I attribute positive things to God, the things that I say are true of God in an analogous sense, not in an, an exact sense, what's called a univocal sense. So, We see all sorts of language in scripture that is true about God, but isn't true in its fullest sense, if we're going to take it literally. Uh, There are plenty of places where we have anthropomorphic language, meaning language that identifies human things with God. So, you know, we talk about God's nostrils or God's right arm. Uh, There's language about God having wings, which is used in the Psalms a few different times. Jesus himself uses it, uh, speaking over Jerusalem. You know, God... God doesn't literally have wings, right? We, we understand it's an analogy. It's something that is analogous to the truth. God cares for us like a mother hen would use her wings to guard, uh, you know, her children. So that's another way of, of understanding how we, we know God is by use of, of analogy. Well, if you were to ask Martin Luther, how do we know God? He wouldn't start in either of those places. What would he say? He would say, look to the infant Jesus, and that's how you know God. He's right there. There is something concrete about how we know God. Because as, a, as Christians, we encounter God first and foremost through the person of the Son. Because here is where God has revealed himself to us in a tangible way that we can get and grasp that he comes to us. Now, the Christocentric nature of our knowledge of God doesn't mean we deny the other two realities. Those are there. But for the Christian, all that we know about God and everything we say about God is through the lens of Jesus. If St. Paul is right that he is the exact imprint of the Father's nature, and as St. Paul also says in the same book in Colossians, that in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, why would we not look to Christ first and foremost as the place where we come to know God? And so this kind of ideal of wordless, thoughtless prayer 
is not really where the Christian should go or direct themselves. We should direct ourselves to the person and work of Christ where God has revealed himself to us and will continue to reveal himself to us. And Luther recognized in his understanding of coming to know God that the way that God reveals himself to us or his person and work and character to us is often in ways that we would not really expect or perhaps desire. Uh, God does not always come to us in the fullness of his power and glory. There are certainly ways to talk about God in that way, but God often reveals himself and his person to us under what we would consider to be the opposite of God, infinitude and suffering. He comes to us in suffering on the cross, And when you think about God and and understanding God's glory and coming to him, you probably wouldn't first think about an infant, which is why Luther loves the image, the the infant. He loves to say the infant Jesus, that's how you know God, because that's that's like the last thing you expect. But that's how he came into the world, right? He came into the world to reveal himself first as a little helpless infant. And so we come to know the nature of God through those things which, in its proper sense, the divine nature is not, but that is how God has chosen to reveal himself in suffering, and in human form, and in lowliness. Now, it's important to also clarify when we're talking about knowing God through the incarnate Christ, we're talking about one who has a human nature, there is an intimate union between the divine and the human nature of Christ. You know, and you may think like, okay, well, you're talking about knowing the human nature of Jesus, but what about the divine nature? I can know all these things about the human nature, but how does that relate to God, right, in his essence? Um, The human nature of Christ and the divine nature of Christ are so united that they have what we call a personal union, right? There's one hypostasis, which means person. To know the the, the acts of Jesus that we see in his humanity is to know the person of the Son, right? You are not coming to a knowledge of an abstract nature, There's no like just human nature of Jesus kind of running around separate from his his divine nature. You are coming to know him as he is, as a divine person. Actually, within the early church, there's a discussion, especially in in John of Damascus, around the nature of Christ's personality. And the way that this has historically been spoken of is that because we understand Christ is one person, not two, the person that Christ is is actually a divine person. He is a divine person with two natures, not a human person and a divine person. If you have a human person and a divine person, then you don't have one actual incarnate Jesus. You have two separate, I don't know, people sharing a body. And, and that's not what's going on here. And you can't say it's a hu- just he's a human person, because if you say he's a human person, you've all of a sudden got r- gotten rid of the divine eternal personality that is the son. So we say he is, in the, uh, he is a divine person with two natures. So that is to say that when we come to know the person of Jesus and his work, we are not just coming to know the humanity of Christ, but we are coming to know the Son. We are coming to know God himself. Well, where is it then, if God is revealed in the Son, where is it that we encounter the Son? How do I come to know him? I I cannot come to him in his incarnate state, I might love hearing about the infant Jesus, but I can't walk over to him and find him somewhere, right? I can't pick him up. Be pretty cool, but no, I can't do that. Uh, So where do we find him now? We find him in the places where he has promised to be. these These are objective and they are real. So we find Christ where he has promised us he is going to be. And he has promised that he is going to be in his word and in the sacraments. I see a lot of people wanting to know Jesus and and trying to find all sorts of strange ways that they can feel close to him. Uh, I know a lot of people like to go to Israel. If you've gone to Israel, that's great. I'm sure it's exciting. I've never been there. And I'm sure it's really cool to see all the biblical places, and I'm not demeaning that. Uh, But I do hear people almost talking like, well, if I go go into the Jordan River, I'm going to, like, be close to Jesus. I'll be right where he was. And I say, Go to church and receive him in your mouth where you are. You know, like, if you want Christ, he said he's right here. He didn't say, I'm there in the Jordan River forever. Like, go to the altar. 
That's where he's, that's where he's promised to be. So uh, we know God through Christ, and G- Christ has declared that he has given himself to us and will give himself to us through the means of grace where he has promised to be. Coming to know God is kind of easy, actually. <laughs> it's, it's not as difficult as we want to make it out to be. It doesn't have to be a life of pure asceticism and mystical contemplation for years and years until you have a certain kind of experience when now you can see thought. Just go where he's promised to be, and he is there for you, and he is there for giving you. And to be clear, I'm not saying there's no place for contemplation or anything. Those, those can be, you know, good, good things to do. Of course, I, I would say that when we are in those kind of times of meditation or contemplation, I don't know anywhere in Scripture that recommends a kind of contemplation that is without thought at all. I just don't see that biblically anywhere. Um, what I do see is a, a lot of encouragement toward meditation on the Word of God. And so when I think about those you know, m- uh, you know, contemplative or meditative times that are good to have, I think those should be times that are really within the Word of God, right? Quietly thinking through God's Word, contemplating God's Word, looking through uh, God's law and thinking very carefully about how you have broken God's law and asking for a very specific particular forgiveness for your particular sins. But that's a very different thing from a kind of thoughtless state uh, of existence before God. Well, that's the positive construction of this Christocentric nature of, of our life and spirituality and how it is that we know God, that we find within Luther and then in uh, the following reformers. And this Christocentric kind of spirituality, this Christianity that says we are focused on the person and work of Jesus Christ above all other things, and that is the lens through which we see everything else, really comes up against some practices that are happening within the medieval church. So here is where we delve a little bit into some of the context in which this uh, becomes an issue of debate. And that is with relation to the cult of the saints. Now, the cult of the saints has a long and complicated and slow history. Uh, The early church had a very strong reverence for the martyrs in the church. And I don't think that was a bad thing. I think it was a very good thing, actually. You're surrounded by these people who have given up their lives for the sake of the gospel. And when those people died and were martyred, it was the practice of churches to take the bones of those people who had died, the martyrs, and often to build a church on top of them. Well, within the Roman Empire, this was a very powerful theological statement. The idea of doing this was not just, well, if that person died, they are now a saint and their bones have magical powers. Okay, nobody's thinking that way. And that kind of superstition does develop eventually, but that's not the reason why Christians started doing this. They started doing this because Christians believed in the resurrection of the dead. And they believed that the, those people that Rome had killed can ra- and will raise from the dead. And those very bones that, you know, Rome, you think you've got them, you think you have killed that person, God will raise those very bones from the dead and recreate that person and you will be conquered. That was a powerful statement, right? That's, that's beautiful. That's the reason why Christians started doing this. Um, and, and in its original context, it was, it was a, a beautiful thing. Like a lot of things, though, as context disappears, <laughs> uh, some practices that aren't exactly uh, you know, biblical or, or teaching the same kinds of things that the original practice you know, appeared because of start to, start to develop. Um, so you have this honoring of the martyrs, which is very good in the early church. Eventually, though, there starts a practice of praying to some of the martyrs. and there, There's a theological uh, kind of underpinning to this, which again, the, the theological justification is not always wrong, in that there is an understanding among Christians of what we call the communion of the saints. Okay, So when we are in the church, we are in the family of God, there is a union in the church between the dead saints and the living saints. Because the dead saints are, well, not really dead. You know, their bodies are dead, but they're, they're with Christ. They're in heaven. If you look at something like the book of Revelation, um, the, those who are, are dead are 
with Christ, and they seem to kind of be aware of what's going on in the world, right? You have the martyrs under the altar. They say, how long, O Lord? Like, they're, they know Jesus is returning. They're watching the devastation on the earth. They're, they're asking God to, you know, like, how long is it going to be until you, you do fix things, so you return and make all things right? And there is this understanding among Christians that we are, in some sense, united with those who have departed. We, we're in the same church. The, you know, the church triumphant is a part of, and the church militant are part of the same church, ultimately. So this understanding of the union between the, the church of those who are alive in Christ but dead on earth and those who are alive on earth leads to an idea that there can be invocation toward those people who are in heaven. Because the argument is, well, if we're part of the same church and we're part of the same communion, and they at least to some extent know what's going on on earth, why can't we talk to those dead saints and ask them things? Especially because, hey, they don't have sin and they're in glory and God's probably more willing to listen to them than me <laughs> because I'm si a sinner right on this earth. And that's the theological justification for it. But we see, especially in 7th century, we start to really see this develop. And the full-blown, what we call the cult of the saints, actually takes a bit longer than that to kind of come into full bloom. So you see little pictures of it, a prayer to saints here or there. Um, it increases significantly in popularity between 1000 and 1500 AD, that late medieval period. Now, I think that the early Christians were not praying to saints. Uh, I think there's evidence of that, um, not just in the fact that we don't have prayers to saints in the early period, but also because when the early Christians are writing against people like the Gnostic groups, some groups that did pray to angels and other kinds of beings, the earliest Christians consistently wrote against praying to those beings and talked about praying to God. And the arguments don't really make any sense if those early Christians were also offering prayers to saints. And if that was the case, they would have clarified and said that because that would have certainly strengthened the Gnostic arguments. It's pretty clear that the earliest Christians were just not doing that. Um, so it increases significantly in 1000 to 1500 AD. Well, how does it happen? Uh, wh what does it, the cult of the saints, as, as we're talking about, look like? Well, one of the things that happens is you, you start to have certain days in the church year, and the church calendar grows over time. You know, first you've got your great feast of Easter. It's really the first great Christian feast. Uh, we think of Christmas as, at least culturally, many people think of Christmas as being as important, but historically it really hasn't been, but it's a, still a very important day in the year. We have Pentecost, major biblical events. You start to have saints' days being added to what are the major biblical events throughout the year to the point that there are more saints' days than there are days in the year. So you've got days with multiple you know, saints being, being honored. And... The days of honoring the saints in the Middle Ages are not just honoring the saints. Now, there are, and there are different Lutheran liturgical calendars that have been used, and some of those do have days to remember certain saints. It's a good thing to remember people in the faith. It's a good thing to honor those who have lived and died for Christ. We have examples of this in Scripture. You know, Hebrews chapter 11 is a whole text that talks all about the lives of different saints and how they lived out their faith it is good to remember and honor those who have passed on before us. This goes beyond that, though. So there, there is this move that happens from this honoring of the saints toward now invoking the saints, asking the saints for certain things. And as this further develops in this period, saints are basically assigned specific things. You've got patron saints. So the earliest Christians talking about saints, even the earliest prayers to saints aren't about this at all, uh, but all of a sudden you get, well, he's this you know, patron saint of this or that. So if you have a specific request, you have to ask a specific saint because that specific saint oversees whatever that thing is. I've got like the saint over, you know, patron saint of lost things. I know that's you know, a common one. It's like, I lose something. I pray to a certain saint. And, and, and so what happens is you, you move from, in the popular mind, you move from this but it's really like a beautiful theological reality about the resurrection of the dead, as we talked about. Now, too, the saints are basically looked at as um, in a very mechanical way. It's like, I need something, so I've, I've got to go through my list and figure out, all right, which guy do I ask for this thing? And, okay, I ask this guy, so I get this thing. Yeah, it is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, it's like you're going to a bank and, right, going make sure you get the right banks, you get the right stuff out uh, for of the right account. Um, 
So it becomes a very mechanical, kind of superstitious thing at this time. Along with this, you've also got this idea of the treasury of merits. Now, we, already, we talked about this before if you were at earlier, uh, the earlier talks. And the treasury of merits is this idea that um, those who basically need time off purgatory, or we all want time off purgatory, so those who have years in purgatory um, have certain opportunities to kind of pay off early some of the years they're going to be suffering in purgatory. One of the ways to do that is to, say, give indulgences. And when you give indulgences, money to the church, the church then dispenses merit on your behalf, which gives you years off of purgatory. That merit is from the treasury of merit. The treasury of merit includes the merit of Christ, the Virgin Mary, and then the saints. So the saints do then have a kind of saving role in some way in that when you are looking to get time off of purgatory, which is an immense period of suffering, part of what saves you from time in purgatory is the merit of the saints. So they have a kind of saving role. They can't save you from hell, but their merits can save you from time in purgatory. You also have this distinction that's made at that time period between uh, latria, dulia, and hyperdulia. And this is a difference between worship and veneration. So worship is due to God alone. There is veneration, which is given to the saints. This is why you have prayer to saints. You have bowing before statues of saints. You have things that may look like worship. They say that is veneration, not worship. And then you have something called hyperdulia, which is like super veneration, which is given to Mary. So uh, what this, allow this distinction allows for then is essentially what really are acts of worship to be given to the saints but given a different title so it doesn't appear to be idolatry. And I still contend that that's what it is because the, the, the kinds of things that are done toward the saints are things that scripture attributes to worship. And that's really the question with the prayer of the saints is, you know, I, I understand the theological justification behind, okay, the union of the church in heaven and the church on earth. I understand the theological stuff going on there, but I just ask the basic question of, is there any scriptural example of prayer not being an act of worship? And, and that's the difficulty that I think is there, that prayer is assumed to be throughout scripture an act of worship by itself. So if I know Rome wants to make the distinction between veneration and worship, but is that a biblical distinction? Can you actually make that distinction? And, and I just don't think that's the case. And we could talk about, uh, you could actually take a, a bunch of passages in the Psalms about asking God for deliverance and parallel them with passages about Mary that are very, were very popular in the medieval period. And some of them are almost exactly one-to-one -one parallels. And when you get to asking for deliverance in the same way you're asking for God for deliverance in Scripture as an act of salvation and worship and using that kind of language toward Mary, the saints, I have a hard time seeing the veneration worship distinction. Well, a lot of this develops uh, because Christ is repeatedly and increasingly seen as judge rather than savior. You've got a lot of emphasis on Jesus during this period as one who is there at final judgment to send people to heaven and others to hell. So in popular piety, there's a kind of fear of Jesus that often is the case among, uh, among people. Because of that, all of a sudden the saints seem nicer so you do have Mary kind of stepping in as a, as a mediating figure in some way between you and Christ. Uh, you know, this, this is still taught today. There was a viral clip of a priest like a month ago that went around that I saw uh, where this uh, priest was talking about how he said the, you know, the closest way to get to Jesus is through his mother. And it's the idea that there is a kind of easier path to get to Jesus for him to hear you that is through the Virgin Mary. A very popular conception today. You still hear it taught um, pretty clearly. And what happens in medieval piety is Mary ten tends to be identified with mercy and Jesus with judgment. And as much as, you know, I know Rome has reasons to say, you know, no, we don't believe that there are multiple mediators in the fullest sense that Jesus is 
And they like to say, well, because Scripture says this, right? There's one mediator between God and man and identifies Jesus. He's the one mediator. And Rome is going to say, well, you can't say that because if you ask someone to pray for you, they're mediating. Okay, sure. But the question is, are they mediating in the same way that Jesus is? Like, is God more likely to show you mercy because you are uh, ask, you, you are uh, praying to that person, right? Are, are they, like when someone prays for you, you don't have the idea that they are closer to God, so therefore God is going to dispense his grace because I asked this person to pray for me. I don't think. I don't know. I mean, let me, let me know if any of you are that close to God that he listens to you more, and I'll talk to you. We'll talk after, you know. Um, another thing you see developing in this period is that hymns are written more to saints. Um, and so at least one text that I've read uh, claimed that at least in certain medieval hymn books, there are more saints written to Mary than there are to Jesus himself. And so that just shows you what popular piety is like um, at many places in this time. So how do these practices then that we're talking about relate to what we're talking about with this you know, Christological focus. Well, all of these things that we're talking about here that develop, prayers to saints and days for saints and talking about patron saints of this or that, the biggest issue with all of it is that it just takes the focus away from Christ. It's such a distraction. And when the church is gathering together regularly and You're gathering based on the day to observe or honor this or that saint more than you are Jesus himself. You just, you've missed the big picture. You've missed the point. And the reformers understood this, that people are not focused on Christ. They don't understand who Jesus is. They they may be able to tell you the names of tons of saints, half of whom didn't even exist. I mean, we know this. We know that there are plenty of saints that have no basis in reality that people are praying to. You have people that could tell you all of that, but they can't recite the Apostles' Creed. (laughs) can't tell you the Ten Commandments. They can't tell you about Christ and who he is. What the Reformers did was maybe a bit radical at first, and that was they got rid of all the saints' days in the church here. It was just gone. And what they did do was say, let's just observe the days of the year that are about the life of Christ. Because if you've got this saint day, that saint day, that saint day, that saint day, circumcision of Jesus, another saint day, another saint day, right? It gets lost in the mix. You're, you're missing the central point. So the, the calendar got stripped down. It was basically just the Christological days because what is the purpose of the church year? The purpose of the, the feast days of the church year is to live the life of Jesus each year, right? You start with the season of Advent. You look at the promises of the coming of Christ. You have the birth of Christ. You go through his uh, circumcision and his dedication, and then you go through his baptism and the beginning of his public ministry. You have the transfiguration. You have, uh, you know, then the the season of Lent where you talk about the, the temptation of Jesus leading to Good Friday, to Easter, to Pentecost. It's this cyclical sharing in the life of Jesus every year. That's the point of why this church calendar exists in the first place. And when you put the focus just on these different days to honor these different saints, you're, you're, you're missing the central point. Now, it has been the case that since that time, as I said, many, many have kind of started to reincorporate some of those days to honor certain saints uh, throughout the year, which I don't think is a bad thing. Um, but the central focus and the central purpose of worship is Jesus and the delivering of Jesus to you, sinners who need Christ. Because sinners ultimately do not need just to be told which saint to pray to for which problem they currently have. Sinners need the Lamb of God who is slain for them to take care of their particular sins. And that's why we exist, why the church exists, why we're Christians. Because We are centered on Christ. Well, okay, and I want to have, you know, a little bit of time for questions, so we'll have about 10 minutes here, but let's see. Uh, Quickly to conclude here, what what does this Christocentric idea mean for daily living? 
Now obviously we've talked about what it means to have this kind of Christological central principle. We talked then about kind of what went wrong in the medieval period and the, and the response to that, developing the central Christological principle. What does this mean for my life today? Well, first, it means there is no aspect of the Christian life which is not viewed through the lens of Christ. You should look at every single aspect of your life and everything that you do and everything that you think through the lens of the person and work of Jesus. It's something I I, I notice when I talk to pastors and scholars and theologians from all sorts of different Christian traditions is you can have a conversation with them all about theology and you could talk for two hours and they could talk to you all about the attributes of God or whatever else it might be without mentioning the name of Jesus once and I bet they have no idea. But I count. I always pay attention. I do. I pay attention. I've been to conferences where you hear a bunch of speakers all talk about the Bible and you count the amount of times they mention Jesus and often none. Or maybe just like kind of moral example. It's not how we should approach the Christian life. As St. Paul said, all, all treasures, wisdom and knowledge are hidden in him, as I cited earlier. To live is Christ, Paul says. There is no Christian theological discussion that is not about Jesus. If you talk about anything without mentioning Christ in a lengthy way, in terms of a theological conversation, it's not Christian. There are places to talk about it in a philosophical sense, right? The, the nature of God, talking about it in an apologetic sense, those kinds of things. But if we're talking specifically about Christian theological discussion, if it's not centered on Christ, it's not Christian. So we shouldn't, even very true and good things, right? I just published a book on the attributes of God. Uh, And when you're talking about even things that are a bit abstract, if it doesn't come back to the person and work of Jesus, you know, I just, I, I question your method of theologizing. So, everything should be done through a Christological lens. Christians should not just be talking about God in the abstract. Again, there's a place for that maybe in the, in, you know, when you're talking philosophy or, you know, in the civic sphere, there's, there's a place for that when you're talking about general things of like how does society function, moral law, those kinds of things. But when you're in a, especially with other Christians, you're in a theological conversation, we shouldn't be talking about just God, knowing God. What does it mean to know God? What does that mean? Like, you know Christ. So, ultimately this, Christ should never be a secondary thought. Like, your, your, your Christian life should not be anything plus adding Jesus a little bit at the end. Like, I'm going to do the Christian version of this, which is I just, like, stick a little Jesus over here. To be Christian is to look through the lens of Jesus at every single thing you do. And as Christians, that's how we are called to, uh, called to think about our, our lives in Christ uh, and how we view the revealed word of God in Scripture. All right, so I do have like 10 minutes or so for questions. I, I haven't heard anyone talk about purgatory unless it was in a Catholic uh, you know, uh, setting. Uh, why uh, why is this uh, relevant anymore? I thought it, purgatory was just a thing we, uh, they used to get money out of people. Yeah, well, um, the reason I talked about purgatory was um, really because what I'm doing is giving a, a theological context to these ideas in the time of the Reformation. So, uh, so that's why the focus on some on purgatory is I'm trying to show, because we're talking about Martin Luther and the Reformation in these principles, what were the things that led him to those conclusions? Um, but just to say, purgatory is still very much taught by Roman Catholicism today. You know, I mean, you, you think of it as a medieval idea, but it's not like it's, it's not like you don't encounter it. I mean, I, cer- I certainly do, at least in my experience, talking to some converts to Roman Catholicism. Um, they, they certainly believe in purgatory. So I think it's still uh, relevant to have a conversation about, for sure. Do you know of uh, anyone in the medieval period who thought of uh, adoration of the saints as um, 
polytheism. Yeah, they're actually, oh my goodness, and uh, I cannot recall his name right now. There, there was an author in the ninth century. I think he was in Spain. Um, well, we have an, an extant treatise of his that is very condemnatory of the cult of the saints. And I, I should have his name and dates off the top of my head, but uh, maybe it's lack of sleep, but I can't recall at the moment. Um, I, the thing is, at that era, well, it was fr- from his, if you read his treatise, it's clear that it is becoming very prevalent. The prayer to the saints, and were his ideas prevalent, his, his critiques? I don't know. And there's a significant problem, I was just telling somebody else this, but uh, in church history, that we don't have a lot between that like 600 ish era of Gregory the Great, and then, you know, you get to the break of the new millennium, you get the rise of scholasticism, you've got your, you know, Peter Lombard and your St. Anselm and Bernard of Clairvaux leading towards, um, you know, the time of the Reformation. So you do have this gap of like these 400 years where we don't have nearly as much written material as we do for the other times in the church. And there are a number of reasons for that. Um, some of it is the literacy rates were not, were not very high. People weren't writing as much original work. As I said, you had these kind of compilations of patristic sources that were more popular. Um, but because of that, these developments often happen in that time period that we don't actually have a lot in writing. Maybe there's more that I don't know about. I'll tell you, it just in terms of my own research, I can never find scholarship on that era when I want to answer these questions. It's like, I want to know, where did this develop? What's the first? And, and it's almost like most sources will just kind of skip from Gregory to, you know, about 1,000. And these things have already developed to some extent. And you're like, what the heck happened between? Like, is everybody sleeping? What happened? Uh, we do have, as I said, we do have documents from that predestinarian controversy. Um, but that would really be your key time for the development of the cult of the saints. Maybe a church historian you know, more knowledgeable than me in that area would have an idea. Um, but at least in my own research, uh, that that one, I think he was Spanish, but I'm not, I could be totally wrong. I'll post this video and somebody's going to yell at me about it. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> other than, than that, I'm really, I'm really not sure, unfortunately. How should we um, view this, the saints today? Should we, you're not opposed to like uh, having a saint stay or? Uh, yeah. How do you watch that? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, just this is the way that the Lutheran confessions talk about the saints, is that there is a way to honor them. Um, the, f- the best way to honor the saints, and I think this is Hebrews 11 bears this out, is to have the faith of the saints, to look first at the nature of their faith in Christ and imitate that. So anything you're doing in terms of honoring saints or anybody else that's not pointing you toward Jesus is wrong, right? You're, you're doing it wrong. Um, so the way that I think we honor the saints first is we do look to their faith in Christ, uh, and, and we, we honor that, and we use that as an example. Like St. Paul will say, follow me as I follow Christ. So there is certainly a biblical sense in which we have examples of faith that we look to, and those am- examples are for us to imitate. Um, you know, the like Melanchthon, when he deals with this, you know, says, okay, so look at, you know, if you're an emperor, look at the life of David. Focus on the life of David. Why? Because he was had the same vocation as you, and he was not always faithful, but <laughs> sometimes faithful. Um, you know, so there probably are certain people of faith, whether it's dead saints or even living saints, people that you know that you can follow, um, to serve as good examples of how to live out the Christian life, especially ones that will relate to you in a particular way, like that that example. Um, so we do honor them in looking at their lives as examples and, you know, following in, in virtue. If you see somebody who is a Christian and was a virtuous leader in business and you're going into business, well, it's probably really good to have those kind of role models and examples in the faith. Um, and oftentimes those can be those who, who have departed. So I think a proper way to, to, to honor the saints is we should talk about their lives, we should remember them. Um, but when it comes to the question of, like, invoking them, We've certainly gone, I think, beyond what is biblically merited. Yeah. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, 
And I'm trying to apply this to spirituality. So sure. how do we, you know, get this to fit together with Jesus teaching us to pray to the Father and having this kind of Christ-centered meditation or spirituality? Which which part of it? The I'm, I'm thinking about the, the Lord's Prayer where he... he so you're talking about... Well, yeah, which which part are you having a hard time putting together with that? Mm. So if we know God through Christ, yes, and the way we know Christ is by, for example, meditating on how He's present in the Word, meditating on the Word, um, then how does that in practice look in our spiritual lives when we are praying to the Father? Yeah, so yeah, I think well, it's just you know we, we come to know Christ not just by meditating on the word but just through the word itself right not just my meditation on it but god's work in and through it though my meditation on it is certainly part of that uh yeah we it's just with the understanding that when we pray to the father we are praying to the father we know that we are doing that through the mediatorial work of the son right so that's why when we pray we commonly say in jesus's name um, do you have to say that at the end of every prayer well the lord's prayer doesn't say that at the end does it <laughs> you know no but 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 it's the it's that understanding right the understanding that i come to god as father because christ has made me his brother so that i'm in the family of god through christ and now i can have this relationship with the father if that makes sense so it's just understanding the christological kind of dimension of that yeah all right well thank you mm -hmm.